Starlink. Say the word just five years ago, and it was just another harebrained scheme from the world's most controversial ultra billionaire. But today, it's a vision made reality. A network of thousands upon thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit, Starlink is nothing short of a man made constellation. And it's well on its way to expanding internet access across the entire world. It's a vast network, already 6,000 satellites strong, and potentially growing up to six times that size in the very near future. It's soaking up government contracts, it's paving the way for mass produced orbital networks, it's skyrocketing upward in its subscriber numbers. But for the people in charge of one particular island, Quasi Nation, Starlink, it ain't enough. The Republic of China, known around the world as Taiwan, is a semi recognized nation staring down the barrel at an enemy it cannot defeat. Isolated on an island archipelago between East and South China Seas, Taiwan has a number of powerful friends on the global stage, but it's a place defined by its greatest adversary, the People's Republic of China, who regards little Taiwan as nothing more than a breakaway province. In a story that's one part aerospace engineering and one part geopolitics, Taiwan has been shown the merits of a valuable strategic asset in the Starlink system, but also has gained a front row seat to see how the choices of one capricious billionaire can make that technology work or make it fail with a snap of a finger. When it comes to Starlink, Elon giveth and Elon taketh away, and for Taiwan, that is not good enough. Instead, they're doing Starlink their way, and the results could change everything, not just in space, but also back here on Earth. All right, we'll be getting to the space elements of this particular story soon, but first, we've really got to understand some dynamics back here on Earth, and particularly why Starlink's satellite network would be so important in a place like Taiwan. Starlink began launching its satellites in 2018, and by 2019, it was sending full batches of 60 operational satellites into orbit at a time, deploying them from their nests and letting them drift amongst the stars. The system relies on so-called small sats, tiny satellites that can navigate in real time and form an interlinking network, beaming data back and forth across the network at astonishing volumes. But in order to actually function, the satellites had to do more than just be able to link to one another. They had to build a network big enough that they could provide reliable coverage in orbit, floating around every which way with a regularity that ensures that no matter who's accessing the network or from where, they'll still be able to establish a connection with a satellite in orbit and thus tap into the entire network. Starling reached that point of saturation in 2021, just in time for the world to learn how the network would perform, not just in peacetime, but also in times of war. The primary testing grounds of the technology would of course be Ukraine, where in February of 2022, the entire country found itself in the crosshairs of a full-scale Russian invasion. In the days immediately after the invasion began, the Ukrainian government issued a desperate plea to SpaceX, asking that the Starlink network be activated over Ukraine in order to provide connectivity after Russia had destroyed the country's pre-existing internet services. Four days after the invasion began, Starlink was bringing Ukraine back online, allowing Ukrainians to reach their loved ones, spread information to each other and to the outside world, and to access critical knowledge about how the war was developing, where Russian troops were advancing, and whether or not they were safe. Very quickly, the entire world was treated to an explanation of how Starlink or systems like it could be used during wartime. Ukraine used their satellite uplinks to fly and coordinate the use of aerial drones, using small household drones to spy on the Russians out in the field, and strapping explosives onto them in order to launch surprise attacks against vulnerable targets. They used Starlink to operate innovative naval drones, explosive fast boats that can cut through the water and sink Russian combat ships a thousand times more expensive than those drones are. And Starlink has been integral for Ukrainian collaborators in areas Russia controls, special operators in the field, and more, providing fast, real-time intelligence on what they're doing and where to point Ukraine's artillery and missiles in order to take them out. All of that, of course, is interesting for any nation that might one day find itself at war, but for Taiwan, it is exceptionally important. Taiwan fully expects that one day, and quite possibly sooner rather than later, it's going to find itself in a direct conflict with China, where, like Ukraine against Russia, Taiwan will be badly outmatched. It's not entirely clear what China's strategic leaders have cooked up as part of their battle plans, but it is highly unlikely that wiping out Taiwan's internet access wouldn't be a part of that plan. 
for Taiwan to have Stalin at its disposal, it could change the game in uh, what would probably be an all-out defense of its own territory. Give Taiwan consistent, reliable access to Starlink, and it'll be much better equipped to fight back against an invasion from China, quite possibly even using many of the same naval drone tactics Ukraine does in order to sink what would almost certainly be a lightning assault by a flotilla of Chinese landing ships. Keep internet access, and Taiwanese drones could stop the landing ships, and Taiwan could stand a chance at stopping the invasion. But the Ukraine war also made clear another reality of the Starlink system, specifically that Starlink is not under the collective command of the free world. Instead, it's under the command of one Elon Reeve Musk, age 53, of Pretoria, South Africa. And as the world has learned in recent years, the priorities of Mr. Musk are not always the priorities of the rest of the world. Take, for example, an incident from the Russia-Ukrainian war when, as described in a biography of Musk released in September 2023, Musk allegedly ordered Starlink engineers to turn off Starlink service in a part of Ukraine where drones were about to attack a major Russian warship. According to the biography, Musk was concerned that Ukraine dealing that sort of black eye to Russia could prompt a nuclear retaliation. This claim was later retracted by the biographer who'd made it, but Musk had previously made clear his willingness to threaten Starlink connectivity for Ukraine. As Musk is quoted as saying in the biography, Starlink was not meant to be involved in wars. It was so people can watch Netflix and chill and get online for school and do good peaceful things, not drone strikes. The quote ends. And nor was this just a Ukraine problem. During the course of the Israel-Hamas war, Musk has faced calls to spread Starlink access to the Gaza territory, but has so far refused to provide the service except for specific Israel-approved aid groups in ways that get a sign-off by the Israeli government. For Taiwan, the individual criteria Musk used to make those decisions are basically irrelevant. Far more important uh, was the principle of the thing, that Starlink, regardless of its potential, could be provided to a certain place or cut off based on what Musk judged to be appropriate. Starlink and the company that owns it, SpaceX, are private corporations. They're beholden to their leaders and their shareholders, and if the interests of those shareholders are opposed to the interests of a wartime Taiwan under attack, well, sucks to be in Taipei then, doesn't it? Taiwan tried to get access to Starlink in the past, but was rebuked when SpaceX demanded that it have majority ownership of a joint venture. Musk and his businesses have a close relationship with China and manufacture Tesla cars in Shanghai. He's even on record echoing China's views on Taiwan. To assume that those stances and interests would be deemed less important than America's defense commitment to Taiwan is a hell of a gamble, isn't it? Even Starlink's close ties and ongoing contracts with the American Department of Defense aren't enough. After all, even if those retracted claims from Musk's biography about cutting off Starlink in Ukraine weren't true, the allegation's mere existence makes the situation exceptionally hard to manage. Do you take the chance and assume Musk and SpaceX were benevolent but maligned business people who would of course provide internet access in a pinch, only to find out that the assumption was dead wrong at the moment that China's opening missile salvo is laying waste to the internet infrastructure that Taiwan relies on? Or do you assume the worst, even if you end up being wrong and build your own capabilities while you've still got the chance? Taiwan, it should be no surprise, they chose the latter option. In order to build its own iteration of a Starlink-style satellite fleet, Taiwan will need to check a few boxes. It will need to spend years building satellites, testing the technology, and launching and evaluating prototypes. It will need to build the facilities and the infrastructure to begin full-scale production, and it will need to allocate no fewer than several billion dollars for the task. But as research lead Liao Zhonghuang, director at a state-sponsored Taiwanese industrial research Research Institute put it to the New York Times, quoting, The Ukraine-Russia war gave us a profound reflection. Even if the cost to build it is high, in a special scenario, the value of having our own constellation is unlimited. The subtext here? Well, at least for the time being, money is no object, and time is of the essence. Taiwan's new satellites don't have to be Starlink replicas, exactly, but they do need to have a few things in common with SpaceX's satellite fleet. In terms of procurement, the satellites will need to come in the thousands, meaning that they'll need to be small enough and particularly light enough to launch into orbit. Cost for any sort of space expedition, manned or unmanned, really skyrocket once you start adding mass to the rocket that's needed to get into orbit. Spending enough fuel to put something into space can be prohibitive if the thing you're trying to move is too big. The launch mass of Starlink's various satellites range from 500 pounds on the low end to nearly 3,000 pounds on the high end. That's 227 through 1,250 
kilos. They've also got to be able to travel in low Earth orbit, a critical step in reducing latency time between signals being sent to the network and being received, largely because the network's satellite nodes are simply closer to the Earth's surface, about 100 miles or 160 kilometers up. But putting satellites of this type into low Earth orbit means that you've got to build a massive fleet of them. Geosynchronous orbit, that is, an orbit that perfectly matches Earth's 24-hour rotation and allows satellites to stay functionally above the same spot on land, takes place way, way higher, about 22,200 miles or 35,800 kilometers out. Since these Taiwanese, not Starlink satellites, are going to be zipping around so close to the Earth's surface, a fleet of a dozen or two dozen or even a hundred is not going to provide consistent coverage. Even though Taiwan is basically only trying to get coverage for its own archipelago, it's got to saturate Earth's orbit so that in a probabilistic sense there will always be enough of the satellites close enough to Taiwan to form the kind of fast, high connectivity network that Starlink provides. Multiple hundreds of the satellites, at a minimum, will be required. To that end, the preliminary work has already begun. Over 40 Taiwanese companies have already been enlisted to work on different elements of the future supply chain for the satellites, from onboard electronics to the outer casing to the propulsion mechanisms and more. It's also working to figure out solutions to its rocket problem, hoping to move beyond single-use rockets at some point and setting aside financing to deal with the purchase of, quite frankly, stupid amounts of rocket fuel in the coming years. Right now, SpaceX is the industry leader in the rocket development field, and Taiwan has attempted to reach out to the company to get some support, but it's a losing effort. In the United States, elected leaders in Congress have worked to put pressure on SpaceX to assist Taiwan via Starlink, with one representative, Mike Gallagher of the state of Wisconsin, even going so far as to say that SpaceX may be in breach of its contracts with the U.S. government if it doesn't make Starlink available in Taiwan. But while Taiwan itself seems to keep a lukewarm openness to the idea of collaborating with SpaceX, that doesn't appear to be anywhere near the likeliest solution. Taiwan will likely have to go it alone, not just in terms of its actual satellite development, but in its rocketry, with foreign governments like the US or the nations of Europe limited by their own technical expertise and the limits on just how much knowledge they can divulge, when that knowledge, too, is often proprietary for SpaceX. What Taiwan builds, it most likely have to build all on its own. And to that end, it's important to talk timelines. Starlink has taken about five years to launch its current fleet of six or seven thousand satellites into orbit, and while SpaceX doesn't have a national government's entire budget at its disposal, well, it actually comes pretty close. It's possible that Taiwan could invest more or lean on foreign partners like the United States to work on a faster timetable, and it's probable that having SpaceX's proof of concept to learn from is going to be a fairly massive help. Working fast does come with its cost. It's easier to get things wrong, or worse, to get things wrong and realize only after thousands of satellites have been launched with a critical vulnerability on board. But Taiwan isn't just in a race against the clock. It's in a race against the ambitions of Beijing, and absolutely must ensure that its satellites are in orbit before those aforementioned landing ships come calling. Taiwan has set a bold timetable for the maiden launch, hoping to launch its first satellite into orbit by 2026, but expects considerable latency after that. A second satellite will only launch by 2028. Four test satellites will be on the way after that, and a quick glance at that timeline would suggest that mainline production of the things may not be possible until the early 2030s at best. Even assuming a sped-up launch schedule, which in itself is far from a guarantee, Taiwan may not reach orbital saturation of its satellites until 2035 or later, meaning that for the next decade, Taiwan had best hope and pray that China bides its time, lest Taiwan learn that its expenditures on satellites would have been better spent on missiles and really big guns. Taiwan's money is already flooding into the project. Per President Tsai Ing-wen, well over a billion US dollars have been pledged in order to take the best of its four test satellites and proliferate it in such numbers that a whole internet network can be formed. In the meantime, Taiwan will be finding Starlink star coverage in other ways, not by relying on Mr. Musk for the job, but turning instead to UTELSAT OneWeb, Europe's Starlink star program. OneWeb has already come in handy for Taiwan in a limited way, providing connectivity to hard-hit locations in the wake of a major earthquake this year. Taiwan plans to build 700 satellite terminals on its own territory, compatible with the European satellites as well as what Taiwan wants to build in the future. For now, those partnerships should be enough to hold Taipei over during the hard slog of development, and in a work case scenario, once Taiwan's Starlink analog is online, these international partners can provide a critical redundancy if, say, China was to bring down the entire Taiwanese network through a cyber attack. 
said another Taiwanese researcher at a nationally funded think tank, quoting here, We need to invest in more than one system. We can't put all our eggs in one basket. With conflict potentially on the horizon and fears of conflict very deeply felt both in Taiwan and abroad, its leaders have very little choice except a geopolitical full send to throw a whole lot of money, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of political capital, and a whole lot of hope at the project and pray that it all works out for the best. For Taiwan to lose all internet access during a full-scale Chinese invasion isn't simply a matter of the country's jaded teens being unable to ironically watch Taiwanese Netflix as J20 jets streak overhead. It would cripple a highly technologically advanced main island that, quite frankly, may lack the means to defend itself in analog form a hallmark of a 21st century society. Perhaps it was a grave strategic misstep, but it's the situation Taiwan finds itself in now, and it's a hell of a lot easier of a prospect to build a satellite network in low Earth orbit than to pivot Taiwan's entire defense apparatus on a dime. But we've still got to ask the biggest question of all. Can this plan actually work? And as unsatisfying as it may be, the accurate answer is that it's simply too early to tell. This is a new initiative by Taiwan, only really kicking off in this year, 2024, and it's spurred into action by hard lessons learned in 2022 and 2023. It is an urgent affair, make no mistake about it, but it's one that will succeed or fail based on the efficacy of projects, initiatives, and individual leaders that have just started to become relevant. There are quite a few technological hurdles standing in Taiwan's way but at the same time there are quite a few partner nations around the world who would be more than happy to help how exactly those competing influences shake out we won't know until we get there and although we feel confident in saying that this will be a messy and complicated process there are a lot of different flavors of messy that taiwan might inadvertently choose from will it be the kind of messy that hurts taipei's ego or the kind of messy that dooms taipei's people well that can only be revealed with time but there are already some positives Taiwan can take away from this initiative. The island's insistence on scaffolding its way into its own satellite network by relying on international partners in the meantime means that Taiwan is presenting China with far less of a critical window. If Taiwan had nothing, and then at some point in the future it would develop something, then China would be incentivized to strike before that something comes online. But putting a stopgap measure in place is a big help for Taiwan to close that gap. Also a positive for Taiwan is its ability to take its recent role as a leader in global tech and expand that role significantly. Taiwan is the world's leading source of advanced semiconductors by a mile, but as other countries work to develop that capability, Taiwan will need to branch into new areas to avoid being undercut. If the country can mass-produce better alternative communication satellites than anybody else, then there's a new market to be pivoted toward. If it builds the precision machinery and industrial prowess to launch a space industry at large, then even better. And with such substantial investment, and quite likely such substantial international partnership, it stands to reason that this could be a net good for Taiwan's science and industry in the short term. Spend billions creating something revolutionary, and you'll probably find a few cool things along the way. And finally, it's important to note that even an incomplete satellite network is a hell of a lot more resilient to attacks than what Taiwan currently has, namely just 15 undersea cables linking it to the rest of the online world. At the same time, Taiwan will have to reckon with some major challenges as this project progresses. It should go without saying that China has a vested interest in ensuring that the initiative is a flop, and much like how Israel interferes with Iran's nuclear program or Azerbaijan acts as a geopolitical bully to Armenia, Taiwan is likely to find itself dealing with sabotage, interference, and outright theft from its mainland adversary. Its satellites may have to be equipped with countermeasures to deal with China's anti-satellite weapons and attempts to steer its own satellites into crashes with Taiwan's. And speaking of crashes, Taiwan will be contributing to a very well-populated environment in low Earth orbit where Europe satellites, Starlinks, Taiwan's, and everybody else's will be swirling around blindly for years on end. Just one or two collisions will create the sort of space debris that could not only knock out other satellites from every system, but create a cascading effect of crashes and collisions that eventually renders low Earth orbit unsafe for even a single satellite. Taiwan will need to think carefully about how it works with those other entities, including Starlink, to build systems that allow each satellite in orbit to maneuver to avoid all the others, creating a unified system that would do a lot of good for humanity, but that an adversary like China could also target, or that would put power and leverage over the situation back into Starling's hands. To say that Taiwan's new initiative 
is a bold step into a new future is one of the understatements of the month. Taiwan will have to build the sort of satellite network that's only ever been attempted a couple of times previously. It'll have to do the job faster and overcoming steeper technical challenges than those who have gone before, and it'll have to build that network not just to spread internet connectivity to the world in peace, but also to be resilient in times of war. There's no guarantee that it'll work, and there is no guarantee that China will allow it. But in a way, that's the entire point. When SpaceX built Starlink, it was corporate profit that hung in the balance. A vision for a world with fair and accessible global internet, sure, but also corporate profit. When Taipei makes the same investment and endeavors to complete the same mission, the stakes are nothing less than the future of a free and safe Taiwan. By its nature, that is a vision for which Taiwan can spare no expense, and then it won't have any guarantee of securing until the job is done. So let's keep our attention on this and see how it plays out. We'll keep you updated.